we have, first of all, thank you, colleagues from the Gardena Valley. Yeah? Gardena Valley is one of, I guess, 12 or 13 valleys. <laughs> they made it possible yeah? uh, to uh, come up here uh, with the funicular and stay here and have a couple of hours uh, together. Uh, but first, before we have to walk, uh, we have to work a little bit. Yeah? Uh, but I can promise that this kind of work is uh, a nice work. Uh, uh, before Kurt Huger will start with his presentation, I'd like to welcome uh, Günther Bitscheider. Günther Bitscheider is uh, coming from this valley. He is speaking the third official language of the autonomous region of South Tyrol, which is Lai. Yeah? So he is speaking English, German, and Italian. That's what we all do. But he is also speaking Latin, so uh, he has uh, an advantage more. I would say. <laughs> um, Günther Bitscheider is the managing director of the tourism hall of uh, Selva Gardena, Wolkenstein Gröden. Uh, and uh, well, he invited us to come here, and uh, I'd like to give it for Günther. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Rich. So it's well. We are the only one who has been here to the tourism industry. This is my first world tour in Ladino. Ladino is the oldest uh, language that we have here in South Tyrol, in Alto Adige. And we have not just this ancient language, but we have also a long tradition in tourism. So the first tourism board, the first tourism association, was founded at the end of the 19th century. That means that we have a more than 100 years old tradition in tourism. Uh, during these last 100 and something years, the tourism had a long uh, evolution. And uh, for the future, one big item of the future, or one big goal for the future, is our strategy. Our strategy has more items, but two, the two most important items of our strategy is the sustainability and also the internationalization. I know it's not uh, easy to find the right balance, but it sure will be a challenge for our future. And I hope also with this evening that uh, I will get some important important inputs to um, yeah, to take this inputs also for our strategy. Thank you, Ara. Thank you, Gerhard, for being here, and thank you for all you coming to South Tyrol and here in Selva in Bargadena. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Günther. Uh, uh, we are warmly welcome here. And uh, so let's start uh, with a presentation by Professor Kurt Luger. Kurt Luger is uh, there is another UNESCO chair uh, of cultural heritage and tourism at the University of Salzburg in Austria. Furthermore, he is a development policy activist and founder of the international non-governmental organization Eco Himal, uh, where he works together with the local population of the Himalaya to improve living conditions in the region. So he is very, very close to challenges uh, with, with mountainous areas on a worldwide scale. So uh, one aspect uh, we can see here uh, with different challenges probably than in the Himalayas. Uh, but nevertheless, he's an expert, and so we invited him to talk about UNESCO heritage sites and its challenges regarding visitor management. He's an expert focusing on heritage, which is one of the uh, elements in the title of this conference, Destination Heritage or Destination Future, or hopefully both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you. So when the, when the floor is mine, we can start rock and roll. Um, I do not want to compete with the scenery. You spoke a lot about airport competition. This is a, a losing battle for me. <laughs> I cannot compete. I can only hope that the fog is coming up a little bit more quicker, so your distraction will be a little bit less, perhaps. Then. And I'm just a, a footnote on the on the day. Um, I was quite happy 
uh, that my Finnish colleague gave his comments, kind of wrapping up what we have discussed and finding the, the red thread through the afternoon. Um, because, as you know, tourism is such a complex system and everything is connected with each other things. So if you touch that one, the other one is already in your mind and you hardly come to a really precise description. And if you come to a description, it's even more difficult to find the proper solution because everything is again connected in interrelationships. And uh, understanding this, um, I reminded me on, on an kind of experience, uh, an incident in um, the world best uh, pizza parlor uh, in Kathmandu city. Um, And the waiter, waiter, come to me, come to me, and he showed up and uh, the waiter asked him, what would you like to have, what sort of pizza, and he, said, and he said, the monk said, one with everything. So the swift guy disappeared, and after a while he came back with the pizza, the monk had a full plate, and he did what he had to do with the pizza, and then he had to pay, and he gave him a big bank note, and the way he took it and disappeared. After a while, I understood that the, the monk became a little bit uncomfortable. And he is again asking, calling the waiter, said, waiter, waiter, come to me. And the waiter said, yes. And the monk said, where is my change? And the swift waiter said, change must come from within. <laughs> <laughs> I found this is a very nice story and it fits perfectly to a fireside discussion with you. Unfortunately, the light is too bright so that the, the images are not shining that, that brilliantly as they should. But uh, nevertheless, um, I was instructed to give a powerful speech and so that I will try my utmost to fulfill his uh, expectations. Um, we are also talking about culture, which is again a cosmos, based on a hundred of years of, of thinking, of deep thinking. And the second aspect is heritage, another huge field of research. And some of us, or many of us, I don't know, have discussed that and, and went thoroughly to that subject. Unfortunately, this evening I can only touch this and that. So I expect uh, your tolerance if I once in a while are just browsing a little bit or just uh, giving a glimpse on this and that and not go into that details uh, when um, discussing uh, in a kind of critical way how we deal with our heritage. And our means our society, the global society, and not just the people of the Val Gardena or the, the villages here or there or the inhabitants in the city of Salzburg, where I'm from, and I would like to uh, take the opportunity to salute the Dolomite World Heritage uh, from the World Heritage Salzburg. This is the famous Italian style, what we have, the, the, the pearl of, of architecture in the city of Salzburg with the, with the, during the last days of the classical music festival. Um, I think that the past, and that is what heritage uh, is discussing here, has never been as beautiful as today. So we easily can go, walk slowly through these uh, cityscapes or wherever, or in the natural landscapes, and um, can admire the great past. So that is one of the elements of successful cultural tourism. And what is the cultural tourism looking for? He is looking for the beauty and he is looking for the real thing. So not just fake images, the real thing is like here in the academia. So the real David is not in front of the palace, it's inside the academia. And so that means already that the cultural tourist had to work a little bit before he sets foot on the destination. 
So that means prior understanding of what is the, the tourism product, so to speak, is or should be expected. Um, the past, as a cultural heritage, has become a tourism product. And I think uh, this cultural tourism is growing because it is a sort of edutainment. So it's a, a kind of narrative, a nice narration that is not too, let's say, um, educative. So it, it is a specific form of, of uh, cultural memory, but not from the school books, scholarly books or so. So it's easy to absorb, easy to understand, to a certain extent, up to a certain level, of course. But that is why it's so attractive. And uh, it allows the, the tourists to immerse themselves in the history without taking advantage of whatever it is. So more or less, this is an exotic sphere for most of these uh, visitors. And um, I think uh, it's a, co a contrast to the everyday life. We are surrounded by wars, climate uh, uh, catastrophes, and, 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 and. So this sort of rescue or this understanding of rescuing, getting a, finding a refuge, so to speak, out of these uh, troubles is most welcome, of course. So tourists are kind of escapers from the everyday life to some extent at least. Only during the pandemics, people wanted to have the everyday life back because they understood everyday life has its, its benefits as well. So it's not just a tragedy and the, the daily chores are terrible to carry for uh, some people, of course, but those who are able to travel, they found out that the mobility is, of course, um, a major achievement of our societies, and they want to have this back. We have a lot of so-called dream worlds in this cultural heritage tourism. So the castles of kings. And as we know, only since the French Revolution, this has become property to the, to the ordinary people. And that means also they have, that they have to take care of it. But at the same time, they go there and it is their property. So they have the right to immerse in them, to find out what is the, the, the benefit of strolling around, getting an understanding of historical uh, circumstances, etc., etc. So what has been in former days, only the, the area for the aristocratic people, Nowadays, it's open to us. And this is what, what tourism can uh, provide. The highest distinction of, uh, as for a space of extraordinary universal significance is the inclusion in the World Heritage List that is done by UNESCO. So this uniqueness makes a World Heritage so special and highly attractive also for tourism, of course. This is also the reason why they, they travel. So I consider this a, a profane a pilgrimage. So they uh, want to see everything through their own eyes, like the famous scholar Petrarca, you might have heard of him. Uh, he is considered to be the first who went up a high mountain just for pleasure, only to see, to see the, the extraordinary height of this terrain through his own eyes. And uh, in his writing, he says he was so emotionally moved, etc., etc. While I'm writing this, my heart is still beating. So that more or less is saying. Then researchers found out he wrote that piece only 70 years later, when he was already in his prime. And <laughs> that is a, a kind of um, similarity to some of these stories, like the, the Messners and the other mountaineers of our days are writing. So they are quite uh, emotionally writers, and they want to catch their audience through this sort of uh, narration. I think this is done by the architecture or by the site in uh, various uh, sites by themselves. The only problem that is existing is the great number of people showing up at the same time. So that is, that is the real problem. 
Uh, world heritage, by definition, is a fragile, non-renewable resource that must be protected to ensure its unique character. Both tangible and intangible cultural treasures are imperial. Most endangered are intangible cultural treasures in the developing societies, third world countries. The uncontrolled development of tourism is just one among the threats. It's not the biggest from my point of view. There are so many others. But it is, of course, it can be. And we can easily erase the question mark here. It is a conflict of goals because heritage is what is passed on from generation to generation. And the basic principle is maintenance and conservation. And tourism is the modern phenomenon of mobile leisure. Underlying principle is consumerism. That's what we do. We consume the landscape. We consume the resources here and there. Currently, we have roughly 1,200 World Heritage Sites. And the basic understanding of it is the World Heritage Convention that was signed by around 180 um, uh, signatory states. And it is a binding treaty under international law. So it must be included in the national laws as well. <clears throat> um, to become listed in the World Heritage List means that this site has to be a masterpiece of human creativity, for instance. There are several criteria, I just mentioned a few of them. Or it must, uh, uh, it must represent a, a significant period, or um, it is a unique or magnificent historical site, or an outstanding natural phenomenon like this in front of us. The Dolomites are one of those uh, World Heritage Sites, and they are, of course, in peril, and one of the most visited, the Instagrammable, one of the most Instagrammable sites is the Prag Savilse, the Lago di Braes, which is not far from here, as you know, and um, they have had troubles for many, many years. I think they have found a kind of provisional solution to mitigate the problem to some extent, but still it is not that easy to handle these enormous numbers of tourists. Um, the sites are really different uh, from various point of view. So these 1100 are not, or 1200, are not similar in that sense. The only similarity is that they have to be safeguarded and should be protected very well. So like the Mont Saint-Michel, it's a very exquisite um, monastery, and it has a parking space for roughly 4,000 cars, which is not far from there, and brings us already to the discussion of climate. What is the um, uh, greenhouse gas producing on uh, the World Heritage site? Because, of course, tourism is creating a lot of traffic, and also World Heritage traffic, cultural uh, tourism traffic, creates a lot of uh, greenhouse gases and other um, um, negative aspects uh, as well. Uh, the stupas of Bagan, for instance. When I've been there the first time, uh, it was not yet a World Heritage Site. Uh, the, the Western tourists even climbed up the steps to the stupas. A Buddhist person never would do that. But it really damaged uh, these uh, uh, stones, these sandstones, which are already in a kind of erosion uh, situation. So it was necessary to, to put them into a kind of a confinement, which is a kind of uh, fence is built around so that people cannot go too close any longer and to destroy uh, the treasure. Uh, another point, another famous World Heritage sites are the thousands of terracotta warriors. They are nicely confined in a, in a huge excavation a site in the city of Xi'an, it's on the Silk Road, and millions of visitors come to see them. And um, we understand that it's easy to protect them if they are in a specific uh, limited terrain. Another point is, if these uh, heritage uh, treasures are in a city environment, so you need a lot of regulations and laws and whatever prohibitions are to, uh, to protect it. The zoning is necessary so that the atmosphere has, uh, um, that the atmosphere can, can, can work, so to speak. Um, the 
uh, integrity of the site is not under threat. So the legal framework is of importance. And in countries with a, a weak uh, governance, um, the legal uh, support is even less uh, solid, so that there are many loopholes in, in a law or in those laws and then can uh, ignore it easily. And we have to understand that this safeguarding is the, the major uh, challenge and the major principle of the World Heritage Convention to maintain the authenticity and the integrity to preserve it for future generations. <clears throat> the overarching goal is sustainability. That means preservation in the long run. Um, and that means also to find a, a long-lasting balance as far as tourism is concerned. So it's a sort of reconciliation of these two goals. So not consuming at all costs, so to speak, and to bring um, a kind of regular visit the flow into this area, to giving a, a solid uh, basis for a perfect perception. In my point of view, the highest quality needs also a high quality perception. And if you're just running uh, through the 17th, 18th, 19th century within an hour or two, you have not understood what is provided and what is uh, going on in front of your eyes. <clears throat> so that means a good heritage preservation needs good governance. And uh, this is an approach that comes to grips with these uh, complex uh, problems. And you know, UNESCO is dreaming of a highly participatory uh, management. That means that all stakeholders are involved. If they come to a mutual understanding how to deal with it, it's much easier to protect and to safeguard uh, the site in the long run. We have, together with uh, Swiss colleagues, we have done a study on uh, benchmarking uh, world heritage and tourism, and we found out that some towns with a solid governance work quite well and do well with their uh, heritage and their preservation. We see here that Salzburg city, for instance, is, was rather weak in communicating because the, the local politicians were not that much in favor uh, in doing all this legal work, etc., etc. They had the understanding of marketing, uh, world heritage is fine, and it's just enhancing our, our tourism uh, product. In fact, it is not the case. In fact, the major goal of the World Heritage Convention is safeguarding. And if the tourism business is utilizing the World Heritage sites, they have to take their load. They have to work on that. They have to engage and must work together with those who are uh, in charge of it. The World Heritage site is a subsidiary um, obligation. So that means that the municipality of Salzburg is in charge of it. But the state Austrian Republic has done uh, the, the, uh, the signing of, of this uh, international binding law. We did a, a similar study on mountain regions and we found out that, for instance, the Swiss, as we know, solid uh, governance, etc., doing also very nicely here in that respect. And um, our region where, where I've been working for many years, Saga Mountain National Park, the region around uh, Mount Everest, has shown the weakest tourism performance because there is not much control. And the, the worst thing currently is the number of helicopter flights. It is a national park, which should, <laughs> I'd say, national park in, is not uh, somehow uh, in, in directly in connection with, with helicopter flight. Only for emergency flights, for instance. But in this case, it is a business that is done by local people. So how can you impose a law or regulations against the local population? In fact, it's just the number of Sherpas who are involved in this business, but these are the big wigs, or as the Nepalis say, the fat cats. So they, they rule this area and they are the dominating people. We know it also from other regions. That principle is, I think, worldwide known. Uh, 
for me, the, the, the best model is um, um, how, the, for the good governance, is the, the character of the Concordia Square. This is the biggest glacier in, in the Alps. Uh, and the, this uh, 28 uh, uh, Swiss communities have signed uh, a memorandum of understanding, so they are working together. Even there, it's here and there. Problem, the, the new uh, cable car, etc., etc. So there is a lot of discussion always necessary, but from the principle, it is a well protected region. It's not the same case in the Saga Mountain National Park. I bring you just a, a few slides from that area. It is a uh, um, national park since 1976 and the World Heritage Site since uh, 1979. Um, and of course, everybody, every mountainous heart is beating a bit more uh, faster, standing in front of Chomolugma and Sagamata, meaning higher than, a, mount, than a, a bird can fly in the local language, or a mother goddess of earth. That is, of course, the ultimate goal of, of every uh, mountaineer, or, or many of them. The, the reality is a different one. So you always have to run in the Kumpu corridor from village to village, from lodge to lodge, Difficult to find a place during the, the peak season, and the peak season is when there is not winter and when there is no monsoon. You can find your Everest experience with yourself alone in monsoon between April and September every day, but there's no mountain to see. It's like that outside. See? The gods are on my side. Thank you. That's very nice. So, less distraction for you. <laughs> so, of course, these, these uh, tourists bring a lot of, of euro and, and dollars and leave tons of yen, but they also leave tons of garbage. And it was too much. And we started in 2011 and had a, a basic, started with a basic uh, waste management uh, system setting up in National Park. So that means cleaning of the mountain and the surrounding. We also provided some uh, toilets on the way and uh, 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 pits for the garbage, and we even had an incinerator to burn the garbage, which would have a nice filter. Unfortunately, during the quake 2015, it was kind of an um, epicenter. Uh, this uh, incinerator collapsed like some buildings, and the, the valley, uh, the, the, the village of, of Tame, uh, where we have built our hydropower project, uh, has been the victim of a, of a flood just three, four days ago, a glacier uh, collapsed and a flash flood went through and the village. Unfortunately, no casualties. And unfortunately also, and, and, and no, yeah, gladly, no unfortunate, um, no casualties. And also the hydropower project was not touched by these um, debris, etc. So meaning cleaning the mountains is going up there and bringing all this garbage down and pack it. Uh, it was funded by uh, a Swedish uh, uh, organization. So they gave us also these uh, big packs and it was then carried down on the back of people or on the, on the back of yaks and was then uh, presented to the media. In total, it was nine and a half tons. So that's quite, quite a number, but it's not the thing that to bring it down and then they can again start no, the idea was to introduce a new cultural pattern. How to deal with garbage? Because the local people do not have plastics. They do not have glasses and this and that. Only through tourism, they need this. The nutrition for tourists is packed, plastic packed. In former days, everything was eaten up by the goats or the sheep or the yak. No? Nowadays, they can't do that. So that means a lot of garbage is on the way around. And the, the heavy load was even uh, flown out by helicopter. We had several flights for bringing material to the hydropower project. And by, on the way back, we took 50,000 uh, beer bottles. So that you see that mountaineers are also beer drinkers, ardent beer drinkers over the years. And this was um, um, flown out and giving back and the money that we got for it, we, we could pay for the collection of, of, the, of the next load, for instance. But the idea of that, the overarching 
objective of the World Heritage Convention in this respect is the protection and preservation of the unique biodiversity. That is the goal. And that is reality. We have criteria for overcrowding and for overtourism, as you know. Mr. Beklana has written a lot on that, several else have done research, etc., etc. We know that the perceived too much in a city environment, for instance, is detrimental to the idea of tourism. And the tolerance of local people is at the limit in various places. And here, I have to be fair, this line up on the Hillary Steps from the South Pole happens only because all these 500 waiting for the summit had to wait for fair weather conditions. And when the forecast was saying the next day is, it will be clear, all went up and rushed. That's why they are standing in line up there, which is totally uncomfortable. It is rather cold and it is also dangerous, of course. So from my point of view, we need destination management if we consider villages or sites as a destination. Not everybody will agree with that. Not all the villagers consider themselves being inhabitants of a destination. So that is a, a theoretical aspect that has been uh, raised also by, by your colleagues. And we are also thinking in that and working on that issue. But that brings us to the enormous important questions. How many tourists can a World Heritage Site absorb? There is no thumb rail. So it, there's not one number that fits for all of the sites because the sites are that different. But we have to understand that there are uh, limits of resources. So the infrastructure, for instance. The tourism exposure can be measured. That we know. We have to work on that to find it out what is the carrying capacity of a valley like here or there, or as a city, uh, a small city like Salzburg. We have 150,000 uh, people in the city, but the city center is very small, it's just two hectares. So it's all of these 10 million people, 10 million want to see the city center and not the residential areas around. So that is a complete misunderstanding. If you, if you have the idea, you can, you can guide tourists from here and there. They want to see the real thing. They want to see these 65 churches in the city center. That's why they are here. And we have done research with my students, um, this kind of tracking. Have you heard about that tracking methodology? So it's a kind of academic stalking. When tourists leave the bus, their coaches, you go with them. So they don't understand that they are stalked, so to speak. And to you have to observe what they do, counting, etc., etc. After three hours, usually they are back to the bus. And then they are asked, what have you done? What have you seen? And if there are three hours in the city, and they say, well, I think there was a nice church somewhere, and we had to wait a little bit outside the Prada shop, then it is definitely a wrong understanding, a misunderstanding of World Heritage Site or cultural tourism. But this was one of the responses. And that is also a matter of tour guides. We have excellent tourist guides in the city, but many groups come with their own tour guides. And one of my Chinese students, he joined me of, on one of these trips because I wanted to know what do these Chinese tour guides tell their guide, their, their people. I think the Chinese, uh, my Chinese student, he had a lot of fun because he has nothing to do with the city as such. So he was just telling stories. It was nothing that has to do with the the, the beauty of the city or the enormous uh, impact of, of this uh, archbishop and, and archbishop uh, that was a, a unique uh, ruling system for three and, a half, uh, uh, three and a half centuries. So that's enormous impact. It was the most important religious place next uh, to the uh, Pope in Rome. And they were close friends. So that is an aspect. The second thing, what, what I have here is, is um, to, how many can be absorbed in the, uh, under that, in that understanding. The, the, the mood of the local people, there must be a positive uh, sense towards tourism. So 
So the tolerance should not be uh, stretched permanently. And they accept, let's say for the peak season, that they are not alone in the city. As I am never alone in the city. Since 1974, I live and work in the city center. So I can cope with that situation. But during the last 15 years, the number of tourists have doubled and the number of day trippers have tripled. So that is enormous burden on the regular and the everyday life. And I come to that point a little bit later. Um, if, it's, if it's already, um, I forgot that, visitor satisfaction, of course, is important. And the rate of growth and the, 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 how quick is the change for the local people? The adaptation period, how, how long have they time? So here in the arts, we had 200 years of experience to come to grips with all these German uh, tourists here and there. Huh? In Nepal, they had just 25 years or 40 years. So they, they had to speed up. And of course, the change in, in their everyday life is much more drastically than it is in the Alps, because we had to had time to adjust to, this, to that situation. It was a subtle change. And there, it's a rapid change. That makes a difference. And if we have a situation like here in Venice, then definitely it's too late. But I mean, they know that for so many years that the problem is existing. And they haven't done anything. And in many other uh, cities or world, world heritage sites, we have the same situation. The politicians, they don't do that much. So tourism policy is not that what they want to do. They want to have this laissez-faire principle running on. So the individual freedom is the master of everything. And it's fine. But if this system is overstretched, it comes to too much negative aspects, and then it is too late. And we have also the situation in Salzburg already. I hope you can read that. And I hope you can understand a little bit of, of the pictures and see a little bit of it. So that the threshold has reached there. I did a, a quite a thorough study a few months before the pandemic. And now we have more or less the same figure uh, of tourists in the city as we had in those days. So that means the results are still valid. But just a little bit more Americans and a bit more uh, Scandinavians and a little bit less Asians, but that's it. And this survey signals a need for action. And we have asked the local people, what do they want? And the residents want to have the cars out of the city, the coaches out of the city. They want to have the establishment of a solid park and ride system. And they, they want to have these groups limited, so 25 people. There is a rule saying 25 people per group, but nobody controls. And another thing is um, stop for new tourist beds. In those days, we had 15,000. Now we have 17,000. And there are a few hundred more coming. So there's an enormous pressure on the already existing uh, hotels and owners. And then we also have Airbnb, which is really the worst that is creating havoc everywhere. And in Barcelona, in Lisbon, etc. It's, it's just a dramatic situation because people lose their homes due to the renting out of not only one room, entire flats are rented and not just for months, all over the year. So it's a really strange situation because that started with, in former days with this sort of couch surfing. The idea was more involvement, having closer contact to local people, have fun with them and stay overnight on an airbed have coffee together and stroll around a bit. So that was the, the fantastic idea. And it is totally collapsed because of uh, this um, Airbnb. And I think you know that Airbnb is owned by only these huge conglomerates. And the only thing what they're thinking of is huge benefits at any cost. If we want to have quality tourism, then we need limitation. And how you can get a limitation, either through the price or through regulation. And I think that that are the two models. And regulation, in my perspective, is good governance.
So it's not just going here or going there or come later an hour or in the next week. It needs a solid system. And I will talk about that a little bit later. Um, currently, we have a situation that the local people are already reveling against this kind of pushy tourists or so. So this lady runs a fashion shop and she put a poster in front of her shop saying, everybody's welcome, but please say hi, please be kind, please be friend of, to us, please say goodbye, because that's our way and our life. Otherwise, go. In Austrian language, schlechti. So that is, that is the thing. If you are already in a situation like that, the alarm bell is ringing, I would say. And it's not just in Salzburg. Everywhere we have this sort of um, pressure on, on the city environment, on, on the local uh, people, and on the traffic situation. From my point of view, the people in Salzburg are not competing with uh, the tourists for museum tickets. They are competing for parking lots or they don't want to stay in jams for three hours because these individual motor tourists are circumambulating in our one-way system because they don't want to go into the uh, local um, garage system. We have two, two nice mountains in the city of center. One is a huge garage with 4,000 parking lots. 4,000, and it's never full. Very, very rarely when at the end of the Salzburg Classical Music Festival or at the opening, but otherwise you always find a place, a place there. But they don't want to go because they want to park for free. So they don't even want to spend five or 10 euro for visiting the city and being guest in a place which is a unique one. So, I, I'm missing the proper words then, you know? Is it, is it not worth at least a parking fee? Here and there you pay entrance. In Salzburg City, when you leave the garage, you pay extrance. So it's a similar system, but it's not working that well. And of course, all these, these crowded sites um, are somehow different. Of course, they have this and that system to manage and come to grips somehow with it. And it's easy in, in a castle like Versailles, when 2,400 people are inside, they put a padlock in the entrance gate and then it's closed for a while. You have to wait until some tourists are getting out of it. Same situation is happening in Austria's most visiting site, which is the castle of Schönbrunn. You know it from these uh, um, monarchy films, uh, Kaiser Franz and Kaiserin Sissi. I think she is well known here in this region as well. And um, it's the summer residence of the Habsburg monarchies. And uh, it's a good, good or even best practice model because they control that. So there is no vandalism. 800 people at the same time and then close. But they bring three tons of stones into the castle. Every year, I'm supervisor of a PhD study on that. How tourism, incidentally, so to speak, without any intention, is destroying the treasure because they bring it with the shoes, with this, uh, what do you call them? With this uh, high profile shoes or whatever they are, sneakers, whatever. So, all these little stones, the entire region, as you see it here, is of gravel, and they bring this gravel inside. Now they have realized this is really a damage and they have put a lot of, of um, kind of um, mattresses um, to, to get rid of it because it's too, too much damage uh, that is created. The benefit of this ticketing is utilized for the maintenance of the, of the uh, castle itself. So it's <clears throat> well done. And the same happens also in the third world, the city of Bakhtapur. Uh, in the Kathmandu Valley has more or less the same system. You will be easily recognized as a foreigner. So there's several entrance gates where you have to pay 15 euro and then you can go inside and stroll around. And the municipality is clever enough 
to spend a big portion of that uh, money for the maintenance of uh, of the, the beautiful uh, Nevar Buddhist uh, architecture. We also have management plans, but as you know, it's made of paper, and a paper plan like a national park, which is only existing on a, on a, on a, on a map, on a paper, it's just a paper park, so it, that needs control. And the management plan with explicit goals and all these what we know uh, from, from theory, if this is not properly controlled, then it's useless. But if you want to become, want to become a World Heritage Site, you have to provide all this paper. We are now working on, on the papers for the Großglockner Hochalpenstraße, the Großglockner Panoramic Highway, which was built in the 1930s, and it's really a marvel. And uh, we are doing all this. And there is already an existing management, uh, and also, again, also a, a management plan. Everything is there. Still then, it's difficult to get uh, the, let's say, the, the award becoming listed on UNESCO's list. But the problem in here, in the Valley of Wachau, which is, Wachau, which is a, a wine region, one of the, the best in Austria, is the, the river boats on the Danube River. So they come and there's a flow of a few hundred tourists into the village, which is really a tiny place. They run around and after an hour or even less, they're gone and the next boat comes. How can you survive in such an environment? That is not a regular village life. And we have learned from Dubrovnik even on a bigger scale, the same problem happens. Now they have done in Dubrovnik a nice regulation. So they allow per day only, I think, four these cruise ships to come into the harbor. And then they, even then, it's full, but it's not that crowded as it has been the years before they did that. So my, my conclusion out of this is we have to come up with a, manage, a solid management system. So the marketing, that was the, the, the thing so far on tourism. More tourists coming and here and there for each and everything. And the tourism uh, business people are very, very clever. They are picking up every new idea swiftly. But for instance, sustainability as a concept is not touched at all, or only here and there. Only during the last three, four years, I see here and there, one or some of these uh, projects have been uh, mentioned by Rebecca. Of course, there is some, but there are examples, few examples. It's, it doesn't have momentum, and the business people have not yet understood that they are sowing on the branch they are sitting on. And this is happening worldwide. And this is my, my big um, complaint about uh, the, the tourism industry. So they lack far behind. You were talking about that this morning. It, they're far behind. And I remember um, in 2019, I guess, also before the pandemic, uh, uh, Greta Thunberg spoke to the, to the uh, um, members of parliament and the houses of parliament. At the end of her speak, she said, I hope you could hear me. So that's the same that I'm saying to the tourism people. In 2006, the Swiss came up with an excellent study saying exactly what is happening right now. More rain, more warm, uh, glacier melting. So the Alpine tourism is really in peril. I was going to Zell am See in Salzburg talking to those people, I had to give a presentation, and the title was uh, Sweating Planet Cold Beds. You know what they did? So, you are one of those, you know, nothing is true. Since then, we have thousands of studies. It's more evidence is not possible. And then the Austrian president of the uh, ski uh, organization said, I have read a book. There's a completely different context. So I don't trust these 4,000 studies. I had, I had a book, and they were saying it's not that serious. 
how can you work with such people in the long run? I mean, he's an outdated model, I know that, and he is retired now, and there is a, a, new, a new swing uh, with a younger generation. They're doing a little bit different, and they have understood that this is a problem. But one of the skiers who was an activist, a climate activist, not, not uh, gluing on the street, but he was saying openly in the, in the TV talk rounds that climate change is a matter of fact, and we have to live with that, and then the secretary of the Austrian uh, ski club said, I think these young men will not have a big future in our organization. Can you imagine this? This ignorance. <sighs> Incredible. Incredible. So what we need is a mixture of regulation, recommendation, prohibitions, and we need control. If we have rules and regulations, somebody has to control that. Otherwise, it's just for fun. Nobody, nobody would uh, um, behave properly then. And my vision is um, what I've learned from the city of Amsterdam. They consider it city in balance, in balance. So they are not doing this kind of tourism regulation. They also do city planning together with tourism aspects. They had to have this uh, start rehearsal. They had a big restoration program. So providing homes for people so that the pressure on homes is, is less. They have regulated uh, and forbidden uh, the, the big buses and trucks coming into the city. So this as a so-called holistic aspect, as a, as a really a, a well thought principle, we are not just want to bring trouble into the tourist business. We have to organize our living. That is the better understanding of sharing a city than we had with the Airbnb or have with the Airbnb. So this is what local people and the visitors together can achieve. But that needs a regulation. And that I'm quite in, in favor of. I think this laissez-faire principle that still today uh, has had its best days already. So we have to reduce the pressure on these extremely high numbers, from these extremely high numbers on the local people. And basically, world heritage uh, is the best medium uh, for intercultural communication and understanding because the highlights of culture can be visited. So it's not that the, the negative aspects of a culture are presented. What do we like? African music uh, or uh, Arabic uh, cuisine and uh, whatever, the reggae, etc., etc. So we pick the best in our everyday life and integrate it in our days. And that is the idea of cultural tourism in that sense, that we come to a certain understanding of uh, the foreign culture and um, the, the living uh, uh, situation and everything around that. So then this sort of cultural tourism makes sense. Then you are widening your horizon, at least to some extent. And I'm also a little bit a dreamer. I'm dreaming of a minimally invasive tourism. One of these biologists that I uh, studied thoroughly, he said, humans are the most invasive, invasive species. And Jean-Paul Sartre said that tourists behave like cooled soldiers. And there's something true on that. And if we are arguing for this minimally invasive tourism, then we expect that the tourist is not harmful. The person is widening the horizon and has fun and is a happy person. It's not a Disney world that the, this person is, is visiting. It's a living uh, environment, so we have to cope with that. It's it's not a, a dreamland as such. Only a few of them are this sort of fairy tale uh, sites. But the, the a regular city has its own dynamics, and that in that the, the tourism life has to be integrated to some extent. So to explore a foreign place without being a burden to the local people, and also not on the way. I mean, we have 
highways across the Alps, you know? This is not a real nice environment any longer. We have tons of emissions produced over the years and still producing and producing and producing. So this is not a, a Holocene situation, it's an Anthropocene situation. And we know that the planet is already in a very shaky uh, position. So I don't want to, to blame the single tourist. I think the single tourist has to behave properly, of course, but also the tourism industry has to pay its dues. There's no way out and they have uh, to address these issues. So at the end, what is meant by sustainability in connection with tourism? It must have a long-term perspective. It must be culturally, culturally acceptable. It must be socially balanced. It's not possible that one group gets everything and the other one only the emission gas. Um, it must be environmental sustainable and it must also be economically advantageous. Why should we do that otherwise? And um, at the end, for the exhausted audience, I have a, a small advertisement. Uh, we have done extensively studies on that issues and still doing. And the, the most recent one is uh, about climate change and world health sites in the city of Salzburg to celebrate the silver anniversary of the historic city of Salzburg as a world health site. I hope I have not overstretched your tolerance and wish you a good appetite for the dinner. Thank <laughs> you.